But now, oh my goodness, what we've all been waiting for, how do we manage our human resources? <laughs> Yay! I know this is very exciting for everybody. I like to think about it as counting sheep. Jesus uh, referred to his flock as sheep. I know a lot of people take issue with that because I actually was a sheep herder for a summer. And I can tell you that sheep are not very brilliant and they're very scared of almost everything. So being called a sheep is not something I find to be a... Um, uh, a very positive thing. Nonetheless, it's a phrase that Jesus uses. And in fact, he calls those who oversee the church to be shepherds, that is people who care for the sheep. So I do think about, you know, counting sheep as kind of a, a human management um, allegory. And one of my favorite verses about counting sheep per se, uh, it's a leadership text from Proverbs chapter 27. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. When the hay is removed, a new growth appears, and the grass from the hills is gathered in, the lambs will provide you with clothing and the goats with the price of a field. You have plenty of goat's milk to feed you and your family and to nourish your servant girls. Well, I don't know about nourishing my servant girls. Um, it's definitely from a different cultural context, but I very much love the truth that we see in this. You actually need to tend very carefully to the people under your care. That's the most important thing. The building can literally fall apart, but you can't let the people fall apart. There can be no money, but the people need to be together. And in fact, it's the people who provide any financial resource, any property resource, and any volunteer resource of the church. When you think about shepherding and you think about us being sheep, God is the boss. Jesus is the great shepherd. Sheep were not pets. Sheep are meant to produce for the owner of the sheep, not meant to look around and be cute and just be fed. They provided wool for warmth. They provided milk. They provided meat. They provided everything that a family and a community needed to survive. Well, we have a saying regarding finances with our church planting movement, and this better be true for all of our churches. The harvest or the giving is always in the harvest. The funding is always in the harvest. That is the people of God, the church of God. This is where every resource is. So, Pay attention to your people. As managers and administrators, it's easy to pay attention to numbers, to brick and mortar. But the most important thing is to pay attention to people. Love is the key ethic of the kingdom of God. Amen? Now, having said that, unstructured love is just sentimentality. So let's talk about how we can think about uh, human resources from a management and leadership um, an administrative perspective. First, everything we're talking about today is related to managing and administering people, facilities, and finances. We talked about finances. Now we're talking about people. There are a couple of things to think about, and I've alluded to the love and care for people. That's membership care. That's really not what we're talking about today. So if you feel like we're just going to be talking about numbers now, even though I just said it's not the most important thing, you're right, because it is an important thing, and it is what we're talking about right now. We're talking about developing a team and thinking about who in your church is responsible for executing human resources functioning. Now, regardless of the size of your church, it's likely that in some way or fashion, you're engaged with all of these aspects of human resourcing, recruiting new people, hiring staff, onboarding or training uh, new people into the organization, making sure that people understand the policies of your church, how to execute them, who gets paid what, why, and how, what kind of benefits belong to those that are paid, 
or volunteers? What are the legal requirements of having people, volunteers, contractors, and employees in your church? How do you do ongoing training so that they're able to grow in their ability to execute the functions that they're volunteering or paid to do? How do you correct people when they go awry so they can learn and do better next time? And sometimes, how do you terminate people? How do you keep them from continuing in an area where they're not appropriate to serve or if they've done something requiring extreme correction uh, for moral or ethical reasons, they must go. So these are all functions of human resources. Uh, and every church, regardless of size, does these in some way. So who does it? Uh, in your church. In many churches, it's the pastor. In a small church, likely the pastor is responsible for all those things, recruiting, paying, hiring, firing, correcting, reproving. So it's almost always the pastor. Sometimes though, and I hope this is true, a church will hire somebody and then all of a sudden the pastor needs to make decisions like that, as does the board, who will help administer some of these things. And then sometimes you'll have groups that help do training, for example, or onboarding of new people, etc. So who does HR? Well, most of our churches, it's a combination. A pastor, a secretary, an administrative board, a pastor's cabinet, and or a board of finance. They all work together to see who gets paid what, when, why, who are we hiring, who are we asking to volunteer, etc. All of these things are done. But good news, bad news, in a local free Methodist church, a pastor is appointed to lead the church. And so whether you are serving with a pastor as an administrator or a member of the board, it is ultimately the pastor's responsibility to ensure that these things are happening at whatever level is required for them to happen. So the, the pastor is the CEO, uh, the chief executive officer of a church, and does pastoral work, but also does this key leadership function, making sure that these human resources um, activities are done. So just a little word about recruiting. Uh, real quickly, I just wonder, could you raise your hand if you have uh, just the need for volunteers on a regular basis? Anybody? Yeah, uh, I do. So, and I see Michael does too, and I'm willing to bet that all of our churches regularly need more people on a regular basis to engage the ministry. We started our day praying, you know, Lord of the harvest, send workers into the harvest field. In terms of recruiting, there are some things we could go very deeply into, but I just want to say that we've already talked about this a little bit. The most important thing for you to do, for volunteers in specific, but even if you're inviting people to join your staff, is to always provide that personal invitation. I won't go into this um, any more than we did already about 20 minutes ago, but invite people very personally to join a particular ministry. I noticed that you've been very, very careful. Every time we talk, you pay attention to detail, and I happen to know that you're a CPA at work. I believe, based upon these observations, you don't have to say based upon these observations, I believe that you're uniquely suited to be able to help our church with their budget and finance team. Could you please consider joining the budget and finance team? When you do join the budget and finance team, invite them to do something very specific, you'll be having a meeting. It's about you know, three times a year that they meet, and they, they put together the church budget based on input from the leaders in the church, and they help guide the church as to whether we're doing things uh, very well or, or not very well regarding our use of funds. And I think you can do that. I think that you're able to do it. I'd love to see you do it. How does it benefit them and others? And when you do this, you're really going to help our church go to its next level with a healthy financial plan and very clear and very good steps about how we can bring honor to God through stewarding the resources that are all together in, in our hands. So it's definitely going to benefit the church and the kingdom, but it's also going to give you some new friends, man. It's a great team and you're going to love meeting with them. So be very clear about how it is that you're inviting people into a specific role. This is the best way to recruit. Now I'm gonna ask for a volunteer to recruit me using that same pattern. Recruit me, uh, and you can feel free to make up any set of positive things you see in me for the particular task that you're recruiting me to do. So 
Um, would anybody like to volunteer to practice making a personal invitation, noting the reasons why this person would be good at what you're asking them to do, what specifically you're asking them to do, and how it will benefit them, the kingdom, and the church? Any volunteer? I suppose it'll be me. Go for it, Michael. Uh, uh... Mark, I would like to invite you to help me in, in outreach at our church. Uh, you have a positive outlook. I, I see your Facebook posts and, and you're very upbeat and outgoing. Uh, interacting with other people doesn't seem to be a problem for you at all. And I would very much like you to come on board and help us with that. It will benefit the church in that there will be a positive face in the community representing the church, representing God. And in that way, you will help build the kingdom and bring glory to him. Uh, what do you think? Wow, Michael, I'm totally honored that you asked. Thank you. Which, can I just say, everybody, is the usual response when you point <laughs> out something that's positive and beneficial about that person and why you thought of them. It's almost never going to be a negative response. So, wow, I'm honored by that response. Now, typically, when you do that, somebody will also have uh, two leverage areas of pushback. Um, one is... So I was going to ask for is, is, yes, but I'm waiting for the but the, or the other shoe to drop. Yeah, you're right. you're yeah. honored and, and you're, you're flattered, but uh, no, I just don't want to. <laughs> yeah, it could be I just don't want to or I don't actually feel gifted for it uh, or I'm too busy. So... This is actually, in terms of recruiting, how you help people through that. All, everything that we just shared is absolutely necessary. So um, I'm too busy. Well, this is where you might ask a good you know, kind of reflective question. I know you're busy, man. I see how much you're doing. That's actually one of the reasons I asked you, because busy people get things done. But I wonder, is there anything I can free you up at the church to do to allow you to do this thing that you're uniquely gifted for. Um, if that's the case, then very often you can say, well, yeah, I mean, right now you're serving on six committees and I'm asking you to do one more thing. You know what? This is the most important thing. If you did just this one thing, would you be up for that? Almost always that's a win-win for the person. Find a way to help them navigate the time. If you can leverage that, that's even better. The other common pushback is, man, I'm totally honored and blown away by the fact that you actually think I have those gifts. I don't have those gifts. <laughs> you know, you're wrong. Yeah, I'm smiling, but I'm torn apart on the inside. So, uh, or whatever. So, um, when that happens, then there needs to be two possible things. One, I mean, they they really might not have the gifts. That's true. But you've seen gifts in them. That's why you're calling them out. That's why you're inviting them. So a really positive and healthy response is something like this. Man, yeah, I can really see how this could, you know, make you feel a little bit nervous. Um, and, I'm, you know, maybe not sure about joining this. But let me just affirm, I really see this in you. And I know this is something God has given you to be able to do. So how about this? Would you consider trying it? Just trying it for three months. And I'll be there to support you and coach. You're not going to be on this alone. Uh, and if you still don't want to do it because you don't feel you're gifted, that's okay. I mean, completely trust that. But I wonder if you'd be willing to give it a shot and I'll be there with you. To give that kind of a response often lowers that level of anxiety. There's two things. One, they're not committing to something forever. A big fear that people in church have is they're committing to something forever. <laughs> uh, when we talk about board uh, structure at the end of our meetings today, I'll, I'll just remind people, you shouldn't serve on a board for more than six years, for example. But um, when it comes to recruiting, always make it time uh, delineated. Yeah, three months, a year, we'll give it a shot. And then the other thing is always make it clear that they're not alone. Yeah, I'll help you. Or you know what? The leader of that team, uh, Mao. Mao is the leader of our conference uh, board of finance, by the way. So uh, if I'm recruiting someone to finance, like, yeah, the leader of that team, man, she's fantastic. She'll be with you. She'll give you advice and support. You won't be alone. So those two things will usually take away 
the anxiety around that invitation. Um, but Michael, excellent job with the clear invitation that's centered on strengths that you see, the need, and how it will benefit that person in the kingdom of God. I promise, team, if you engage this kind of invitation uh, in your church, not everybody responds, of course, but you'll definitely see a much higher level of people responding to volunteer and even paid levels of work um, in your church. Okay, so uh, having said that, I'm going to move on. By the way, this is this is true for recruiting people that you need to pay as well. Um, you definitely don't want to hire somebody that doesn't have the gifts. And sometimes in your church, you know who you want to pay. It can be harder to pay people than to ask for volunteers for what it's worth, especially for your church that's starting up. There's been interesting research that shows that if you ask people to do something for fun, they're really happy to do it. And if you pay them to do the same fun task, they no longer are happy to do it. In fact, they get angry about doing it. Isn't that interesting? So when people do things because it's inside of them, it's fun, they want to do it, it's a much higher level of motivation than when people are paid. Because as soon as people are paid, well, you know, if you're paid, if you have a job, then there's accountability, there's requirements that are necessary for you to get that paycheck. There's now control and hierarchy dynamics and all of that. So it can be difficult on the other hand, if you weren't paid to do your job and it's what you do to feed your family, you likely wouldn't do your job because you'd have to do something else to get money. You have to eat for crying out loud. So in many times in our ministry, if we want somebody to give full-time attention to a ministry, we better pay them full-time to do it. If we have a church that's starting out, and doesn't need full-time attention, then it's better not to. I was a bivocational pastor for over 10 years, and most of our church planters and most of our lead pastors, almost 70% of the pastors in our network are bivocational. So most are working um, often full-time or part-time outside of the, of the pastorate. So money is important. Hiring is important. It's not all important. But if you want somebody to give more attention to the church, you got to pay them so they have time not to get money in other places. That's just all there is to it. Okay. Um, having said that, let me move on to some principles regarding hiring and some things that as an administrator or a manager in our churches, you need to be aware of. First, uh, there are essentially two kinds of hires that we make. That's pastors and staff. And there are some differences in the Free Methodist Church. For example, local churches don't actually hire pastors. Pastors are appointed in the Free Methodist Church to a local church who is then responsible to provide the compensation package and management necessary for that person to receive adequate compensation and care. But the church doesn't actually do the hiring and vetting. The conference does that for uh, pastors. A local church, however, does its own vetting and hiring for staff. So when it comes to hiring a janitor or a music minister, for example, um, it is important for the church to understand some important things about hiring. Here, now, uh, Michael, this is kind of geared toward California in terms of some specifics, but it's also, uh, in terms of, in general, extremely important for every organization in the USA. When you hire somebody, make sure you do a background check on them. Um, particularly if they work with children, it's required in California by law, if you work with children, to have a thumbprint background check with the state. Um, but all of our pastors and everybody that works in your church should be able to give consent to a simple background check. In a document with a lot of links that I've sent um, to you and that I'll send again after this, is several links to different companies that will do background checks for about 20 bucks for an employee. I'm stopping this because I don't know, Liz, did I see your hand up? Or, yeah, go ahead, unmute and ask your question. Yeah, you mentioned about, uh, is that the thumbprint or something? Yeah. For staff? Does that Correct. include Sunday school teachers among children? 
Yeah, it does. Now, most of our churches haven't actually started doing this yet. It's a new law that was passed last year. And we provided some guidance to churches to do this. Um, and we'll go more deeply into this with another session. And there's some assistance and equipping for this that you can do. What about uh, youth pastors? If you work with children or minors. Yep. Yeah. Youth okay. pastors. Yep. Thank you. Um, if you don't do those, however, uh, for what it's worth, you should still do a background check regardless, a criminal background check. Now, that's for two reasons. Um, one reason is you definitely want to protect the kids in your church. You don't want to hire somebody that, uh, in fact, could have a criminal background, particularly with sexual uh, predation, right? You don't want that. Most of the time, you pretty much know uh, a youth pastor. Uh, they maybe were in the church. They grew up with you. I mean, you know everything about that person. So you know they were never this kind of person. Um, and you don't have a problem with that. However, when new people come to the church, when families with children come to the church, and they ask, how is it that you protect our kids? One of the things that's important to be able to say is, well, we do background checks. And everybody in our church has passed a background check uh, satisfactorily. To be able to say that lends authenticity and um, comfort for those that come to your church. Mal, your hand is up. What's your question? That's regardless if they're paid or not paid. Uh, yes, that's regardless whether they're paid or not paid. Um, a volunteer court, I won't tell you my opinion of the law passed in California. Um, the fact that I said that even probably tells you that I have an opinion, but uh, that is, in fact, correct. If you have anybody, well, I take that back. I believe they have to uh, have uh, 16 hours that they contribute to uh, ministry in your church on a monthly basis uh, in that particular kind of ministry, whether they're volunteer or not. <laughs> so some of your youth pastors won't have 16 hours um, a month that they invest. Sure. Now I'm gonna go on and continue to uh, talk about a few other of these things. And there's a time for some questions near the end. Um, so just remember to do background checks for employees in specific. And if you have people that work with kids, whether the volunteers or not, uh, definitely do a criminal background check. That's part of a hiring process. And it's part of vetting to protect your church. If you're hiring somebody, or even asking somebody into a significant volunteer position, it's always appropriate for hiring somebody, sometimes appropriate for volunteer, to check their references. I mean, if you don't know them, especially. Uh, if they grew up in the church, you probably know everything there is to know about them and more than they wish you knew. But if you're bringing in somebody from the outside, I guarantee resumes lie. So you definitely have to call and check on what people say about themselves uh, and get some sense of uh, what their previous directors and supervisors were saying. Always do a background check. We have samples on those uh, with the conference if you'd like one. And then, of course, always do an interview. Don't hire people sight unseen. It's not because of what they look like. You definitely get a vibe on people with that personal interview and you get a sense of their level of competence when you ask them questions point blank. So never forego the interview, a background check, or a reference check when you're hiring people. Now, let me say there are some things that should go in every secured employee file. If you have an employee that you paid, uh, they need to have these things. One, every employee needs to complete a W-4 and in California, a DE-4 form, which tells you, how much taxes will need to be withheld from their paycheck. It's a requirement. Also, in our state and the conference, we require you to have a compensation agreement. So make sure it's very clear what the job description is, what they'll get paid for doing it, and what days they're supposed to be doing it on. That's very important. It needs to be in their secure personnel file. That means a locking cabinet in a church office that is only accessible by those authorized to access it. Um, this is part of a requirement if you hire people. Part of hiring somebody also requires making sure that they have a review of the policies of your organization. 
if we're hiring people, we actually we do that with our history and polity class for those that will be pastors. But in your local church, make sure that they know the policies of the church. If you have a compensation handbook, and our conference does, make sure they have it, that you review it with them. Sexual harassment policy, which we have as a conference and a denomination, is also required by the state of California. So when you hire somebody at the point of hire, you must review the sexual harassment um, guidelines, both what they must not do and what they should report if things are done to them. So make sure you review that. You don't have an option. It's the law. So review the policies and by law, especially sexual harassment. Regarding the background check, we talked about the criminal background check, but the federal government also requires that employees complete what's called the I-9. This is an immigration form that ensures that the person that you are hiring is legally able to work in the U.S. by virtue either of appropriate a work visa or citizenship. And there is documentation that every employee must provide to every employer before they can receive a paycheck to be paid. That document must be kept on file in your church as well, but not on the same file as your employee. Keep a separate file for all of your I-9s. That's because this is the most likely document to be checked by a state or federal investigator, and it's best to have those in one place and not to have them looking at every document related to an employee. Then finally, you have to make sure that when you hire somebody, they're properly insured. Workman's comp is a legal requirement regardless of whether they're part-time or full-time. But also make sure that you know what your insurance that you offer as a church is and what they're eligible for. So now there's much more to share on these, and I will be in a minute, but I wonder if there's any questions about what constitutes a personnel file and what's required by law when you hire someone. None. Okay. Um, I believe, Michael, that other than the specific California requirements, everything else, the I-9, uh, without a doubt, um, certainly background checks and all of that are necessary where you are, and uh, the Free Methodist Church requires that we do um, sexual harassment policy review with our employees. State of California requires it, not every state requires it, but the FMC does. So go ahead, any questions? Uh, no, just comments. I I am pretty certain that the state must require it as well here as far as the sexual harassment and a policy review signed. Uh, if they don't, at least all of the companies that I've ever worked for in Kansas, going back even quite a ways, have required a signature on both of those policies. I know just from having done daycare and group home care, uh, foster group home care, my wife and I, in the state uh, that even if it wasn't a requirement uh, by law, it would be a very wise idea uh, to go over those things in particular. Yes. Um, I know that the state of Kansas does not, does not treat pastors as mandatory reporters, as stupid as that statement is, but the free Methodist denomination does. And Correct. again, it's one of those things when you're working with children, you, you need to, if you hear something, you need to say something. Uh, if you see Correct. something, you need to say something. Uh, we actually will be diving into that soon. Yeah. And I figured you would. Uh, but yeah, all of this is is good information for me. Do I expect I will always be at a church this small? No, I'm certain I will not. But having all of this information whenever I step into a church, uh, because stepping into a new church, that'd be one of the first things that a pastor needs to do is go through and see, are any of these things lacking? And I would be willing to bet that in most churches, they probably are. I would agree with you, Michael, they are. And actually, uh, Elizabeth and Mao, make sure that you ask your church about these things. Um, <laughs> On a regular basis, I find that uh, despite clear guidance that the conference offers, 
these are not followed. And it is critical that our churches comply with the law when we hire anybody. Elizabeth? Well, I have my uh, my certificate on sexual harassment as a teacher, but then uh, my question is, do we have a link that we go to at, in the conference or do we just find? Yeah, our sexual harassment policy, it's clearly linked on our conference forms and handbooks page. And also, again, I put together uh, for you students, a long list of links that have everything that we've talked about, including uh, state and federal sites, resources, and how to go about uh, doing all of this. So, um, and our comp our pastor and staff compensation manual, which is easily downloadable from the conference website, uh, cool. clearly includes our sexual harassment policy and is part of what we review um, and would encourage that. Yes, it's definitely available. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. So uh, as you're checking background uh, and references on people, as a church who also employs people, you may be asked by those that uh, will be leaving you and looking for a job elsewhere for a reference as well. Let me suggest that the safest reference given is an affirmation of the dates of employment and positions held, particularly if there were issues with this particular person. Now, I share this because some churches I know would believe that they have a moral obligation to tell every bad thing that ever happened with an employee to any potential employees so they might not mm -hmm make the same mistakes. But let me suggest that you even have a larger moral responsibility to your local church to prevent it from lawsuits and the criminal blowback that may come to you if you're sued by an employee who has let go, moves on to another company, and doesn't get the job because you said they did this or that. Um, so it's just better to give a simple affirmation of dates of employment. Uh, yeah, Michael, go ahead. You moved me when, when you shut off your, your share. Uh, I, did I move you in your heart or just your space? <laughs> you are sorry. today. Yes, you are. Uh, the, the idea of what even to ask when you're doing a background check on somebody else. I was told a long time ago by a friend that about the only thing that they are allowed to answer that would give you any indication plus or minus on whether somebody should be hired is would you hire them again? Would you hire them back? Uh, that's a legitimate and an easy enough question because it does not attack their character. It gives no specifics and you are fairly safe either asking that question or answering that question. But yeah, the, the confirmation of dates and what the, their roles were, just to, to check what they've done, uh, certainly makes sense. And it's unfortunate that we're at a point where you can't answer much more than that. But yeah, Indeed. that is, that's where we're at. Indeed it is. Well, um, okay, yes. Having revealed that sad part of the culture in which we live, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, just pastors. So many local boards, administration managers, and administrators may or may not be aware of the fact that everything we talk about happens with pastors before they're appointed to the local church. So understand that your conference ministerial appointments committee really acts as sort of the human resources department for the conference and is tasked with ensuring that there are quality leaders that are being appointed to our churches. So this is important to be able to communicate with your board of administration and anybody in your church that wonders. So in our conference and in most conferences, we ensure appropriate education, appropriate experiences. There's a mental health assessment, criminal background checks and personality and other assessments that are done before a pastor is appointed to a local church. So we do the kind of vetting to make sure that that happens before somebody comes to your church. Now, having said that, you should do all of that if you can um, with people that you hire, particularly for high-impact jobs, say full-time youth pastor, 
Um, but no matter what the job, there's a couple of things you need. First, when you onboard somebody, that's a funny phrase. It's not related to uh, waterboarding at all. Although if you've been onboarded poorly, it might feel that way. Onboarding simply means providing initial orientation and training to the job. What is the company? What are your values? And what will they be expected to do? Very important, manager and administrator, everybody needs a job description. Everybody should have it clearly written what it is they're responsible to do for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't make their job a universal thing where they're responsible for everything and everybody needs to know what their specific task is. Two, if you're in a church with a lot of well-meaning people, you could have 15 people trying to do the same job in different ways rather than understanding how they can cooperate together as a team. A job description helps delineate which different roles different members of the team will play. So be clear about your job description, and I'll talk about what that should contain in a minute. You also need to have training for a job. It's unfortunate, but most churches hire somebody and provide no training. Here's a mop. Clean the church. Here's a group of kids. Make them holy. Here's a congregation. Make sure that they're singing the right songs. Is about all the training we give for crying out loud the worst possible way to help people become effective members, leaders, and employees in your congregation. So let's talk about the job description. First, every job description, and in the handout that you will be getting with all the links, there are a couple of uh, examples of job descriptions, but very clearly it should contain the purpose of the job, the specific tasks and responsibilities of the job, who that person is accountable to, and what that person will be paid, what are the tangible benefits of the job. So for example, um, this is a basic job description for a digital communications director. The digital communications director supports sharing the story of God at work through the church and providing tools and resources to maintain connectivity of church ministries that promotes excellence and attracts others to the church. That's why you exist. Tell the story of the church and provide tools to other people to tell the story of the church. That's your purpose digital communications director. How do you do it? What are the specific tasks? Pray. By the way, if you put pray in a job description, that means you're expecting them to allocate time on the job while they're being paid to pray. So pray for the church leaders, members, and community. Ensure quality web presence. Plan, execute. The, you might have a different job. I'm just showing you some very distinct task responsibilities for this specific job. The other key thing is accountability. In many churches, it's not clear who an employee reports to. Is it the board of administration? Does the worship leader report to the pastor or to the pastor's cabinet? I don't know. Nobody can have more than one boss. Everybody should have one boss. So in your job description, make it really clear who's the one boss. Now, your boss is not an autocrat. You're a partner. You're helpful, all of that. But you should have one person that you report to. So in this particular case, reports to the pastor. It could be a youth pastor that reports to a pastor's cabinet. Or it could be a musician that reports to a worship director. Or it could be a janitor that reports to the chair of building and grounds. It doesn't matter I'm saying who the person reports to. You just make it clear that that person has one person they're responsible to report to. And then how often they're accountable. Monthly staff meetings, weekly meetings, daily phone calls, annual review, whatever it is, be clear when they're accountable and to whom they're accountable. And just so as there's no mistake, be very clear about compensation. We're gonna, this, in this case, we're going to pay you $20 an hour for 20 hours a week. If you work 30 hours a week, well, stop, because we're not going to pay you for more than 30 hours a week. We're paying you to work 20 hours a week. If you work more than that, we'll pay you more than that, but understand this is the obligation. So make it clear. Here's a training budget for this. If there's a particular perk, health insurance, for example, um, this is a part-time job. This part-time job doesn't get health insurance, but a full-time job would. 
get health insurance, et cetera, make sure what the benefits are. So again, purpose, tasks and responsibilities, accountability, and compensation. Those are all the critical aspects of a job description. Michael, I see you raised your hand. I did. One of the things that I was told in my uh, LMC uh, timeframe was that if you have a part-time employee, such as you outlined there, and they are contracted for 20 hours a week, and they work for more hours than that and are willing to do it off the books, so to speak, uh, in the state of Kansas, that's illegal, and you will get in some serious trouble if they find it out. That's the state correct. will come back in and make you pay for the extra hours, uh, even though it was an agreeable situation to both parties. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so, that, Michael. Uh, that's why I specified number of hours and pay. Now, in the church, everybody's good-hearted, right? I mean, really, as Elizabeth pointed out at the beginning of our conversation, really none of us are doing it for the money. That's not what motivates us. So many times, people that are paid for the church, part-time or full-time, will want to give more of their time. They have a high desire to do it. However, as Michael pointed out, it's not legal for them to do that. They can volunteer more time, but not on that job. So, for example, if in my case, there's somebody that's paid uh, for 20 hours of digital communications. By the way, that's not something a small church would likely do, but a church of about three to 500 will likely need to do that. So, you're paying somebody part time to do that. That person volunteers also as a uh, child minister and does Sunday morning child ministries as a volunteer. Great. That's not the digital communication director job. That's her personal decision to volunteer. However, if she's like, oh, or he is like, oh, I did 40 hours of uh, web update this month. That's not volunteer time. That's 40 hours you got to pay him for. Um, makes sense. There's that clear distinguishment. Okay. Uh, and by the way, that's not a bad thing. Uh, many churches overwork people. <laughs> And this is one case where the law can actually help help us rein in our own desire to milk everybody for everything they're worth. And remember that people have lives beyond what you're asking them to do and encourage them to take appropriate time. All right. Uh, good question. Good comment, Mike. Thank you so much. There are essentially four kinds of people that the church hires or works with, and you need to know a few things about them. One is exempt, the other is non-exempt employees. The other are contractors that you pay for distinct jobs. And the third are volunteers that you don't pay, but you may give some perks to. So let's talk about these. First, almost everybody in your church is a volunteer. I mean, the majority of churches operate uh, through volunteer effort. Many of our pastors are, in fact, volunteers. So thanks be to God. A volunteer by nature, being a volunteer is not paid. That's a volunteer means. However, some churches want to give that person a gift, often called an honorarium. Not because you're paying them for service, you're just grateful. And a nice way to show thanks is to give a gift. That's fine. You can give a gift. You can give an honorarium. But by law, if you give a gift of over $600 in the period of a year, you also need to gift them with a 1099. And re a 1099 is a tax form for an independent contractor or for gifts or for many other financial transactions that will allow that person to report that money on their taxes as income. Likewise, you report that as a church at the end of the year to the IRS. So um, you can give an honorarium, but it doesn't mean that you don't report it. You must report that if it's over $600. However, you don't need to report expenses. So let's say 
uh, or parties. So let's say, for example, that what you do to support your worship team is once a year you provide for them an all expense paid trip to lovely Kansas City. And so when you're in Kansas City, you have a wonderful hotel. That's great. You provide for them the food for that hotel. You pay for their airfare there. That's all wonderful. That's not a paid honorarium. That's an expense of the church in order to provide um, support for travel training and support for volunteers. It's different. So there's a lot of ways you can say thank you to your volunteers, even tangibly. But if you pay them money as an honorarium, it must be reported. Contractors are another key element that many churches engage. That is a person or company that will do a specific task. That is, let's say, for example, putting a new roof on the church. You might need to hire a roofing company or a contractor to do that. Or some churches contract with a CPA or a bookkeeper to do the books for the church. Actually, I kind of recommend that for most churches. If you can afford it, it's really good to take that onerous task out of the hands of a local church that's usually not well equipped to do that. However, if you have a contractor, they are not an employee. So you don't put them on payroll. You don't withhold taxes or anything like that. But you do need to give them also a 1099 uh, at the end of the a year or at the time that they give you the service. So regardless of the amount. So if a contractor comes in and fixes your roof and charges you for his services, $3,000, you still need to give them a 1099. Unless it isn't an individual contractor. If it's a company you contracted with, you don't need to do that. A company that contracts you will give you an invoice. And that company will say, uh, John Kerr's company that does roofing is invoicing you for $1,000. You pay the invoice, and that's an expense that you report uh, on your uh, financial statements. But it's not payroll, and you don't give a 1099 if it's a company. But an individual contractor must get a 1099. I mentioned the number at the bottom of this page of AB5. That's a California law, AB5, that was passed, I believe, three years ago, which forced churches who were paying as independent contractors, people like their youth worker or church janitor, for example, so they would not have to put them on payroll, could simply give them a 1099. Uh, but this law makes that no longer possible. If an individual does those services for the church, that is an employee, unless the individual can verify that he or she is also, as a business, doing that as a contractor for other companies, churches as well. So if you have a youth worker, you have to treat them as an employee, unless they're a youth worker for three other churches, and you can contract with them. But that's pretty unlikely. Hooray for all of this important information. Now, I told you that there were two kinds of employees. We were talking about volunteers and contractors. Now let's talk about employees. In our beautiful government, they are classified not as good or bad, but as exempt or non-exempt. A non-exempt employee is simply somebody that receives an hourly rather than salaried wage. You can be part-time or full-time as a non-exempt hourly employee. However, there are some key things if you're an hourly employee you must keep in mind. First, unlike an exempt employee, an hourly employee gets an amount of money per hour rather than an amount of money over a period of time. A salary might be $50,000 a year. A non-exempt employee might earn $35 an hour works out to be about the same thing, but it's different. Because an hourly employee, if they work more than 40 hours a week, receives overtime. That's not more than 40 hours of pay period, which is often two weeks for a church or a company, but 40 hours a week. So if you work 45 hours, then every, those five hours over 40 must be paid at no less than time and a half. That's a requirement for all non-exempt employees. 
Further, non-exempt employees are considered full or part-time, depending on a couple of things. In California, you're considered full-time if you work more than 35 hours a week. You don't have to work 40 to be full-time. But you have to work 30 hours or more to be required by the state of California to offer health insurance. So if you have an employee working 30 or more hours a week, even though that person might be part-time in terms of hours, you're still required to provide access to health insurance. Almost every employee of the church, except for the pastors, are non-exempt. That is, they must be on payroll, paid hourly, hours tracked, Benefits tracked as well, according to our uh, policy manual for that. Who are exempt? Exempt employees are employees that are salaried. An exempt employee might work, say, for 40 hours a week and earn $58,240 a year. That's not an arbitrary number I put up there. In the state of California, that's the minimum amount of annual salary that a person can earn in order to be considered salaried. So if you make $48,000 a year, you cannot be a salaried employee. You must be an hourly employee, which means the church must pay time and a half for hours worked over 40 hours a week. A salaried employee, however, will earn $58,240 in this case if they worked only 20 hours a week because they guaranteed that salary. However, they also earn $58,240 a year even if they work 80 hours a week. doesn't matter how many hours a week they work. They guaranteed the salary, not the number of hours to work. Well, that's sort of true. That's sort of not true. There are actually clear guidelines in the state of California and your conscience to prevent people from abusing that. However, just as a guideline, the basic thing is you don't track overtime hours for a salaried employee. Here's something that's kind of interesting. All pastors are exempt employees. If you're an ordained clergy person and appointed even if you're part-time. So unlike most other categories of employee, you are an exempt worker as a pastor, regardless of how many hours you work. So a 20-hour a week part-time pastor is an exempt employee. An 80-hour a week overworking workaholic pastor is also exempt, it doesn't matter. That's part of being a pastor. There are many benefits to being exempt for an organization. Uh, the biggest one is you don't have to pay overtime. Um, at this point, I wonder, are there any questions about the differences between exempt, non-exempt, volunteer, contractor regarding how we pay? Okay, I know that this is entirely gripping. Um, but it is also extremely important. Most of our churches have not set up a healthy payroll system and don't make this differentiation. Many of our churches will find it difficult to comply with AB5 because they do have to put people that they hire on the payroll, which means withhold payroll taxes, quarterly send those withholdings to the IRS and to the state of California, and provide appropriate reporting at the end of the year to the state, the federal government, and the employee. So we need to be aware of these things. We have very clear guidance about how to set up payroll, how to pay these taxes on our website, and our conference administrator will be more than happy to help you do that if you need help with that. Okay, a couple of other things that are important for um, churches to be aware of when it comes to managing your pastor's payroll. Uh, first, in the Free Methodist Church, every pastor is required to participate in the pension plan offered by the denomination. So churches don't have the option, even if it's a part-time pastor, not to participate. If they're paying the pastor anything, then 13.5% of the pastor's compensation is an additional amount the church would need to pay for their pension. It's a great pension plan. 
to secure a pension plan. It's actually one of the best in the country. And although it might be difficult for churches to pay it at the outset, I guarantee you are providing something that most retired pastors can never hope for, and that is some sense of real security when they retire. So pay into that pension plan. It is a gift and a requirement. Churches can set up additional retirement options for pastors. Some do, but you're required to participate in the FM pension plan. Uh, housing allowance is another important thing to think about for pastors. Housing allowance is not an additional or a different kind of pay. It's an amount of a pastor's compensation that the pastor can choose to have specifically sequestered as housing allowance, and that is not income taxable. It's actually a benefit that very few people in the country share. Pastors are among the very few that have this option. So I suggest that every church and every pastor take full advantage of it. In order to do so, and we have forms that are easy to fill out, and they must be filled out every year and approved by the board before uh, they take place in the subsequent years. So make this part of your budgeting. But when you fill out the pastor's housing allowance, uh, the pastor determines how much that is. The church does not. And the housing allowance is that which would constitute in general, the cost of living for uh, in a house or apartment for a pastor, mortgage, rent, utilities, lawn care, maintenance, um, all kinds of things that I'm not sure should be part of it, but the government allows it. So take full advantage of it. There's a long list of things the pastor can list and should and take full advantage of it by saying, this is the amount of my uh, salary that I would like to have set apart as housing allowance. That amount you do not withhold taxes from, and that amount is then uh, savings essentially for the pastor. It's very good. What happens if it's the wrong amount? Well, the church doesn't have to worry about that, but the pastor really does. If the pastor uh, actually took said, I'm, I'm not going to pay taxes on this amount, but then can't verify when they file taxes that these are the actual expenses, then they have to pay the difference. And if it's a lot and if it's late, they'll have to pay a penalty. So it's in the best interest for the pastor to actually get it right. But the church is not liable, culpable, or responsibility for what the pastor does with his or her own taxes. So accept the pastor's word regarding housing allowance. Make that part of what you set aside uh, in your budgeting. And it's not different from salary. If you pay a pastor $30,000 a year, you don't add on to that housing allowance. You set a part of that off. The pastor says $10,000, that's housing allowance. So you pay the pastor $30,000 a year, that's the salary, $10,000 of which are set aside as housing allowance. These aren't two different things. There's only one salary, just part of it isn't taxed. That's all. And then another confusing thing for churches is um, regarding Social Security. Most employees, every employee, except for the pastor, will have to have Social Security withheld. Typically, a church will pay half of the Social Security and the church, uh, the employee will pay the other half on their own taxes when they file taxes or have them withheld on their paycheck. Pastors don't pay Social Security by way of FICA automatic withdrawals, as most employees do. They pay SECA, which is Self-Employment Compensation Act. It's essentially self-employment version of Social Security and is paid often through what's called, yay, the self-employment tax. So a pastor pays this um, on his or her own. If a church wants to provide additional support like let's say paying half of that amount as you would for social security for an employee, you can do that, but it's not a tax-free additional amount that you include in the pastor's salary. You add that to the salary as part of the salary package, uh, but the pastor is responsible to pay the SECA. 
Can SICA be withheld just like FICA? Absolutely. And a pastor should file a W-4 just like every other employee. Calculate the amount of funds to be withheld to compensate for this so that those funds are going to the IRS and to the state um, on a quarterly basis just like every other employee. That's best practice. Pastors don't have to. They can actually receive a 1099 at the end of the year and file their taxes quarterly on their own. Uh, many uh, pastors get in trouble with this, though, so I just recommend do a straight withholding. Regarding insurance, uh, full-time pastor is required to receive insurance, health insurance from the church. Part-time pastor is strongly encouraged to receive health insurance from the church. Most churches do not provide health insurance for their other employees. If you can, you should. If it's a full-time employee, you should. The state of California requires you to do it if you employ more than 50 people, which none of our churches do. So we do require you to provide health insurance for your pastors. It's your decision regarding how you handle it with other employees. We strongly recommend that you provide for health insurance for your employees, at least offset some of the cost. There are several links uh, that I provide in the source material that will allow you to take a look at different health insurance options, and there are several that we offer. Now, one of the key benefits that a pastor should be able to have is time off. We have a pretty good vacation policy for our pastors, and we actually have a number of holidays that pastors are able to take. Look at your compensation manual to get the list. But people that are left in the dust on this are bivocational tent-making pastors. Bivocational are pastors that work a job outside of the church in order to make money to feed their families so they can do ministry in the church. Another phrase for that is tent-making because the Apostle Paul himself was a bivocational pastor. He made tents to offset his living while he was being an apostle. So as I said, about 70% of our pastors are bivocational. In that regard, um, what can you give them if you're not giving them money? Well, give them time off. Make sure that they know that if they need time with their family, the church isn't, well, you didn't give us your additional 30 hours a week, even though you're working 60 hours a week for your company. Oh, my goodness. No, don't do that. Be as kind, compassionate, and gracious as you possibly can. I know literally of not a single pastor in our network that has ever taken advantage of taking too much time away from the church. If anything, they give too much time to the church. So church leaders, administrators, and managers really need to be aware that the biggest gift they can give to a pastor is usually time. Give the pastor time. If they don't want to take a vacation, tell them, take your vacation. They say I'm part-time, say, that's awesome. We're paying you while you're on your vacation as if you weren't because we care about you. Give them time. Okay, friends, any questions about exempt, non-exempt, contractor, volunteer, payroll? Yay! Good stuff, and aren't you glad you were part of this amazingly scintillating meeting today? Elizabeth. Sorry, I have so many questions. <laughs> you mentioned about retirement. This is supposed to be paid by the church? The pension, yes. If the pastor receives compensation, then they must enroll in the pension plan. There are some exceptions. The exception, really the only exception, is a pastor who already has a pension plan with a company they might be working for, which some of our bivocational pastors do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm just uh, curious because later on, if, you know, the church will have a full-time pastor, uh, uh, you know, paid pastor, then the church should know about this. Yes, the church should know about this. And the <laughs> church, in fact, your church should be, I mean, I believe your pastor receives a modest salary. It's not a lot, but the church should be looking at paying 13.5% of that into yeah. the pension plan. As soon as a pastor is appointed, that person should start paying into the pension plan for lots of reasons, not the least of which is it takes five years to be vested in the plan. So if you wait, and wait, it could be 
you retire and you were never vested. Or if you start doing it like, you know, a year before you retire, well, it doesn't do you any good. So even if it's a small amount, that small amount for five years gets you vested. So enroll in that. There's no reason not to, except churches think they can't afford it. Well, let me tell you, churches can't afford to allow their retired pastors to be in poverty. What good does that do for the name of Jesus Christ? Thank you. Uh, Mike, I see your hand up. Yes. So the, I, I'm muted. No, I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, I was told that the housing allowance, though still you must pay uh, the self-employment tax on. So it's not totally untaxed. There's just no income tax against it. That's correct. It's income tax. Yeah, you still pay your uh, your SICA on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I might add some churches have a parsonage. And uh, that parsonage is actually considered income for the pastor. And the pastor needs to report that on his or her uh, income as a form of income and pay the uh, self-employment tax on market value of that property or whatever the church says it's worth. So if the church says that the parsonage is worth, uh, say, $600 a month or $1,000 a month, whatever, then the pastor, that's actually taxable for social security purposes, income for the pastor as well. That was a good thing to raise, Michael, thank you. All of the details on this are in the compensation manual. So if you think we missed anything and you'd like to know more, read that, it's all pretty clear. Uh, as well as a form, by the way, that you should fill out with your pastor and it gives an example for employees as well every year to make sure that the pastor and the board are very clear. This is what compensation is. This is how many hours we're expecting you to work based upon the compensation. And these are the basic timeframes that we want to be flexible with. It's not control. It's to avoid conflict. Okay, everybody, we're going to take a 10-minute break.